This is our fifth installment. This is part five as we continue in our series, Spiritual Formation, the Omega of Apostasy. And this message is for Seventh-day Adventist only. This message is for Seventh-day Adventists exclusively. So if you are not a Seventh-day Adventist, I would ask that you would please click this video off. This message is not for you. Now, brothers and sisters, if you notice at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, there is an email address. It is ourhighcalling at yahoo.com. It's one word, ourhighcalling at yahoo.com. If you have any questions and or comments, if you would like to contact me, you can contact me at that email address. And, of course, any derogatory messages and or statements will be deleted and, of course, unanswered. Before we begin, I would like to give a disclosure. We are going to be talking about some very sensitive issues that have occurred in our, the history of our church. These are very ugly moments and very unflattering incidences that we are going to be talking about. But these are facts of history that have occurred within our church. And although for many of us, we may hear some things that perhaps we find shocking, and that we did not know about. But this apostasy in our church has been prophesied about in the Bible and spirit of prophecy. And I want to make one thing really clear. I am in no way encouraging anyone to leave the church. That's not what this is about. Nor am I calling the church Babylon. I am not. I am not calling the church Babylon. But the purpose of the compilation of these videos is to encourage people to turn more sincerely to Jesus Christ and to spend time studying our Bibles, to spend time with God in prayer as we prepare for the coming of Jesus Christ, which is almost upon us. That's the purpose of the compilation of these videos, to encourage people to prepare themselves as we approach the close of Earth's history and the soon coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I just want to give a brief recap as we continue. Spiritual formation, the Omega of Apostasy. In 1540, Ignatius Leota founded the Jesuit Order. The purpose of the Jesuit Order is to destroy Protestantism and to restore the power and authority of the papacy. Ignatius Leola also founded the principles of a mystery religion known as spiritual formation. Spiritual formation is a collection of spiritual exercises which include number one, prayer, different types of prayer, number two, scripture manipulation, number three, emptying your mind, number four, strange worship practices, and number five, going into the solitude or the silence where you have an experience with Jesus. But it is not the Jesus of the Bible because all of these spiritual exercises are unbiblical and forbidden in clear scripture. These spiritual exercises are actually mysticism. It is hypnosis and it is the religion of the devil. In the mid 1800s, God raised up a church the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and God gave a message to the Church of Righteousness by Faith, which the Church rejected. Consequently, a dark cloud came over the Church, which was spiritualism. John Harvey Kellogg wrote a book entitled The Living Temple, and many in the Church thought that this book was new light. They believed it to be a new revelation of the Gospel, but it was pantheism the religion of the devil, the alpha of apostasy. We had also talked about Adventist schools seeking worldly accreditation, where Adventist teachers went to Babylon to be re-educated, and they brought that worldly education back to Adventist schools, and ultimately it found its way into the church. We had also talked about the publication of the church manual. In 1932, the Seventh-day Adventist church published its first church manual, against the advice of church leaders as well as against the advice of God's prophet. 
In the 1950s, the Seventh-day Adventist Church received a visit from the wise men of Babylon. Two evangelicals, Walter Martin and Donald Barnhouse, were inquiring about our Seventh-day Adventist doctrines. It was an opportunity for our church leaders to bear a clear witness of the doctrines that God had gave unto us to be a unique people separate and apart from the world. But instead, our leaders denied our doctrines because they didn't want to be labeled as a cult. Walter Martin had threatened to put our church in his book, The Kingdom of the Cults, unless we would recant. The Seventh-day Adventist Church denied several of our unique doctrines and published it in a book entitled Questions on Doctrine. We had also talked about, in a previous video, Vatican II Council, which issued an ecumenical doctrine calling for all the churches to lay aside doctrine and come together in unity. And at the close of Vatican II in 1965, we suddenly saw the appearance of strange worship practices in the church. The first of these strange worship practices was celebration worship, which is characterized with loud music and began at the turn of the century along with the Holy Flesh Movement heresy. The second was the emergent church, where error can coexist with truth and is called truth. And the third was the charismatic movement, which is characterized with signs and wonders. We also discussed Tony Palmer, who is from the Evangelical Charismatic Renewal Wing, and he characterized himself as Elijah, declaring the protest to be over and calling all of the churches to return to Rome. We also talked about a procession of apostate leaders who began to present their own ideas, believing that they were preaching the gospel. And the culmination of this was the Desmond Ford apostasy of the 1970s, where Dr. Desmond Ford, with his clever sophistries, explained away the sanctuary doctrine. And many Seventh-day Adventists believed Ford's lies and lost their faith in our unique message and departed from the church into obscurity. I want to give you a scripture. 2 John 1, 9 through 11. 2 John 1, 9 through 11. And this is what it says. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine... Do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. So you can see the significance of our unique doctrines. The text says that if you abide in the doctrines of Christ, you have both the Father and the Son. The text also tells us and if we transgress these doctrines, we don't have God or Jesus Christ. And looking at this scripture, 2 John 1, 9 through 11, we can start to understand why the main directive of the ecumenical movement is for the churches to lay aside doctrine and to unite. The call is to lay aside doctrine. This is absolutely mandatory for the success of the ecumenical movement. For all churches to lay aside their doctrine. I also want to remind you of a quote in Spirit of Prophecy. It's in First Selected Messages, page 204. It's in First Selected Messages, page 204. And this is what it says. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists, and that this reformation would consist 
in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God in His wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded, as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement, and the leaders would teach that virtue was better than vice, but God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which, without God, is worthless. Their foundation would be built on the sand, and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. Now I had given this quote to you in Spirit of Prophecy, First Selected Messages, page 204. In an earlier video, I am reminding you of this quote now because we're going to start. We've seen some of these, some of this prophecy already fulfilled. When it talks about a books of a new order would be written, we're going to also see the aspect of this prophecy where it says our religion would be changed. And also, this prophecy mentioned, a new organization would be established. I want you to focus on those aspects of this prophecy. As we continue in our series, Spiritual Formation, the Omega of Apostasy. Let's talk about the World Council of Churches. The World Council of Churches. The World Council of Churches is an inter-church organization founded in 1948. Its members include most mainstream Protestant Christian churches, but not the Orthodox Catholic nor the Roman Catholic churches, which sends accredited observers to meetings. The World Council of Churches describes itself as a worldwide fellowship of 349 global churches, regional and sub-regional, national and local churches, seeking unity and a common witness. It is based at the Ecumenical Center in Geneva, Switzerland. And the World Council of Churches members include denominations which claim to collectively represent some 590 million people in 150 countries around the world. The World Council of Churches, in a push towards the ecumenical agenda, the movement towards a worldwide Christian unity called for a meeting in Lima, Peru in 1982 to establish the BEM document. The BEM document. What is the BEM document? BEM is an acronym for Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry. This document also called the Lima Text published by the World Council of Churches in Lima, Peru in 1982, is the centerpiece for their determination to bring in a one world religion on planet Earth. Let's look at each section of this document and understand exactly what it states, that its members believe and those who sign this document support. Baptism. The first aspect of it is baptism. In regard to baptism, this is the BEM document, page 3. BEM document, page 3. While the possibility that infant baptism was also practiced in the apostolic age cannot be excluded, baptism upon personal profession of faith is the most clearly attested pattern in the New Testament documents. In the course of history, the practice of baptism has developed in a variety of forms. Some churches baptize infants brought by parents or guardians who are ready in and with the church to bring up the children in Christian faith. Other churches practice exclusively the baptism of believers who are able 
to make a personal confession of faith. Both the baptism of believers and the baptism of infants take place in the church as the community of faith. When one who can answer for himself or herself is baptized, a personal confession of faith will be an integral part of the baptismal service. When an infant is baptized, the personal response will be offered at a later moment in life. In other words, this BEM document encourages all churches to make no issue of the mode of or the age at baptism. If an adult consents to be baptized by immersion, that's acceptable. Also, equally acceptable is infant sprinkling. Infant baptism by sprinkling is not a biblical concept. In ages past, myriads of God's faithful people died because they believed a baptismal candidate had to be a consenting adult, baptized by complete immersion, following in the footsteps of their Savior, Jesus Christ. During the Reformation, many, many reformers who rejected the idea of infant baptism to be wholly unscriptural paid for it with their lives and were drowned, ironically because they believed immersion was the biblical method of baptism. These are Protestants protesting against the false doctrines of the Catholic Church, willing to give their lives rather than deviate from the Word of God. This is what the Bible says about baptism. Clearly, it is for coherent, consenting adults. Acts 2, verse 38. This is in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. This is what it says. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is Acts 2, verse 38, to show that baptism is by a consenting adult and that we will receive the Holy Spirit for the remission of sins. Ephesians 4, verses 4 and 5. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. This is what it says. There is one body and one spirit just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. So, there is only one baptism. There's one Lord, Jesus Christ. There's one faith, which is the Word of God. And one baptism is by immersion, representing the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Infant baptism is a doctrine of the Catholic Church. And the idea behind it is the Catholic belief in original sin, which forbids you entrance into heaven until you are baptized into the Catholic Church. Even infants are baptized because it is thought that they too won't go to heaven until baptized by the Church. The Catholic Church teaches that infants who die before being baptized go to limbo. Limbo taught by the Catholic Church is a place that's just like heaven except that God is not there. Here, here's the problem. This BEM document was signed by a prominent Seventh-day Adventist leader representing the Seventh-day Adventist Church among the World Council of Churches as if the Seventh-day Adventist Church agrees with the contents of this document. So this document, the BEM document, was actually signed by a prominent Seventh-day Adventist leader. And we're going to talk about the Seventh-day Adventist leader who signed this document in a moment. Let's look at the second component of this BEM document. The second component is the Eucharist. The Eucharist. The term Eucharist is a term that is almost exclusively related to the worship service of the Catholic Church. During the Catholic Mass, a round this wafer is offered up by the Catholic priest to the congregation as the actual body of Christ, resembling the Last Supper that Jesus shared with his disciples. This is termed the Eucharist, an integral part 
of the doctrine of the Eucharist is the Catholic belief of transubstantiation. Transubstantiation is the teaching that the Catholic priest actually changes the round disc wafer into the literal body of Jesus Christ, and that the wine is literally changed into Christ's blood. This is what is meant by the Eucharist, that the Catholic priest is the creator of his creator. This is blasphemy. This is blasphemy. BEM document, page 10. BEM document, page 10. The words and acts of Christ at the institution of the Eucharist stands at the heart of the celebration. The Eucharist meal is the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ, the sacrament of his real presence. The church confesses Christ's real living and actual presence in the Eucharist. When we recognize the absolute blasphemous claims of the Roman Catholic Church that the priest can recreate his creator, that in the wafer he creates Christ in reality, how could any earnest Seventh-day Adventist ever accept such an unbiblical doctrine or sign this BEM doctrine? How could Seventh-day Adventists honestly sign this? In 1986, the World Council of Churches published a report expressing satisfaction with the Seventh-day Adventist Church accepting the Eucharist. So the World Council of Churches published a report in 1986 expressing their satisfaction with our Seventh-day Adventist Church accepting the Eucharist. The World Council of Churches responded to the BEM, Volume 2, page 341 to 343. This is the World Council of Churches respond to the BEM, Volume 2, page 341 to 343. On occasion, Seventh-day Adventists refer to the Eucharist as a sacrament. Being conscious of the sacredness of the celebration of the Eucharist, Adventists engage in a personal preparation that includes self-examination. In preparation for the celebration of the Eucharist, Seventh-day Adventists practice the foot washing, or the washing of feet. The World Council of Churches can make this statement because there are Seventh-day Adventist churches in Australia and New Zealand and in California that now refer to the Lord's Supper as the Eucharist. So there are churches, there are Seventh-day Adventist churches who now refer to the Lord's Supper as the Eucharist. That's why the World Council of Churches is making this statement. In 1988, the General Conference published the Seventh-day Adventist Belief, our 27 Fundamental Doctrines. This is in 1988. This is the General Conference. They published our 27 Fundamental Doctrines. This is what it says. Concerning the Lord's Supper, Statement of Belief, number 16, this is what it says. Among Protestants, the most common name for the communion service is the Lord's Supper. Other names are the Table of the Lord, the Breaking of Bread, and the Eucharist. This is what the General Conference said in 1988. The Eucharist is acknowledged as the Lord's Supper by the General Conference and published 27 Fundamental Beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist. They acknowledge that. In May 2, 1991, the issue of Adventist Review, Roy Adams, the editor of the Adventist Review, he made this statement. This is May 2, 1991. This is Roy Adams, the editor of the Adventist Review. This is the statement that he made. And we could go on, if space permitted, to mention the World Council of Churches, accentuation of the Holy Spirit and the Eucharist. All of these emphasis fit into the ambit of the three angels' message. Roy Adams here is saying in the Adventist Review that the Catholic doctrine of the Eucharist is part of the three angels' message. Now this is outrageous. This is outrageous. The first angel's message 
is a judgment hour message, a call to all the world to worship the God of heaven, the creator, in spirit and in truth. The second angel's message is a requirement for God's people to expose the false doctrines of Babylon, including this false doctrine of transubstantiation in the Eucharist, and a call and to call sin by its right name. The third angel's message is a message of warning unto the world, if anyone worships the beast or its image, he will receive the wrath of God without mixture in the seven last plagues. The beast is the Roman Catholic Church. Acceptance of the Eucharist is paying a homage to the Church of Rome. And for an Adventist to write, in the Adventist review that the Eucharist is part of the three angels' message. This clearly is an effort on the part of responsible people in the Seventh-day Adventist church leadership to appease Rome. Let's look at the third component of this BEM document regarding evangelism. It's ministry. The third component is ministry. In ministry, all churches are encouraged to witness and to reach out to the unchurched, but never to proselytize from other churches. In other words, if you know that someone is a member of a certain church other than your own church, you cannot talk to them about the gospel. You cannot point out errors or heresies that their church teaches. You cannot try to convert them. You must respect the teachings of other churches, even if you don't agree with them. And you have to remain silent. This is what the BEM document asserts. The acceptance of this agreement would lead to a total separation from the final message which God has delivered to Seventh-day Adventists and has commissioned us to give unto the world. The loud cry of Revelation 18.4, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. This is the loud cry of Revelation 18, that God has commissioned us to give unto the world. But instead of delivering the loud cry and preparing the world for the second coming of Jesus Christ, instead, our church has taken another step in apostasy, uniting with Rome and her harlot Babylonian daughters. January 1982. Over 100 theologians met in Lima, Peru, and recommended unanimously to this agreed statement, the Lima text, the BEM document. They represented virtually all the major church traditions, Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Lutheran, Anglican, Reformed, Methodist, United Disciples, Baptist, Pentecostal, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Dr. Raoul Dederin, professor at the seminary of Andrews University, was the Seventh-day Adventist representative at this meeting who signed this BEM document. So Dr. Raoul Dederin, a professor at the seminary of Andrews University, was the Seventh-day Adventist representative who signed this BEM document. Great Controversy, page 571. This Great Controversy, page 571. The papacy is just what prophecy declared that she would be, the apostasy of the latter times. 2 Thessalonians 2, the man of sin. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. But beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. Faith ought not to be kept with heretics, nor persons suspected of heresy, declares the papacy. 
Shall this power, whose record for a thousand years is written in the blood of the saints, be now acknowledged as part of the Church of Christ? This is the Great Controversy, page 571. In 1957, the leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church gave away several of our unique doctrines with the publication of the book, Questions on Doctrine. During the 1970s, Dr. Desmond Ford deceived many Seventh-day Adventists by explaining away the sanctuary doctrine with his clever sophistries. But the question is, how have we come to the place where our Seventh-day Adventist leaders are accepting the doctrines of the papacy and embracing the man of sin? How has this happened? How has our church, our Seventh-day Adventist church, come to the place where we are now embracing the doctrines of the papacy and accepting the man of sin? Perhaps it's because these men in responsible positions no longer believe that the papacy is the beast or that the Pope is the man of sin according to the Word of God. During Vatican II Council of the early 1960s, four prominent Seventh-day Adventist leaders were asked to attend the council as observers. Dr. Bert B. Beach was one of the Seventh-day Adventist leaders who attended Vatican II Council from 1962 to 1965. Dr. Bert B. Beach has served as both Director of Public Affairs for the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists and as Secretary General of the International Religious Liberty Association. During Vatican II, as a Seventh-day Adventist representative, Dr. Beach said, We prayed together, enjoyed devotional meetings, and formed friendships. It's simply an opportunity to meet, consult, and recharge, to put away hostilities, and worship together as fellow Christians. By the close of Vatican II, in 1965, Dr. Beach, he had formed some friendships. He was worshiping together with all the members of the church that attended Vatican II. When Dr. Beach returned to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, he had explained to us that we had the wrong perception about the papacy, that they have changed and they are very nice people. So when Dr. Beach returned from Vatican II, when he came back to Seventh-day Adventist Church, what he explained is that the papacy has changed, that they're very nice people. In 1973, Dr. Beach co-authored a book with Lucas Vischer, Secretary of the World Council of Churches. The book was entitled, So Much in Common, Between the World Council of Churches and Seventh-day Adventist Church. In the book, Beach revealed that cooperation between Seventh-day Adventists and the World Council of Churches began at Vatican II. So within this, inside this book, So Much in Common Between the World Council of Churches and Seventh-day Adventists, B.B. Beach reveals that the Seventh-day Adventist Church was in full cooperation with the World Council of Churches agenda that began at Vatican II. Here's a question. Can two walk together that are not agreed? What can God's true Seventh-day Adventist Church have in common with the apostate harlot daughters of Babylon? What can we possibly have in common with them? In 1977, Dr. B.B. Beach was invited back to the Vatican to have audience with the Pope. In an effort to ingratiate himself with the Pope, Dr. Beach presented the Seventh-day Adventist Church in symbol on a gold medal to Pope Paul VI. So, B.B. Beach a representative of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, 
he had audience with the Pope in 1977, and he presented the man of sin with a gold medal to ingratiate himself with the Vatican. I want to make a point here. At Jesus' birth, he received a visit from three wise men from the East who presented gifts of myrrh, frankincense, and gold. They were paying homage because they recognized Jesus as a king. Was Dr. B.B. Beach, who was representing the Seventh-day Adventist Church, as he had audience with the Pope, was he paying a homage to the Pope as he gave the Pope this gold medal? If so, spiritual formation is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Destroying Protestantism and bringing all the churches into submission to Rome. It's restoring the power and the authority of the papacy. Spiritual formation is doing its baleful work. It's destroying Protestantism. And it's bringing all of the churches back to submission to the Pope. Great Controversy, page 571. Great Controversy, page 571. The Roman Church now presents a fair front to the world, covering with apologies her record of horrible cruelties. She has clothed herself in Christ-like garments, but she is unchanged. Every principle of the papacy that existed in past ages exists today. The doctrine devised in the darkest ages are still held. Let none deceive themselves. The papacy that Protestants are now so ready to honor is the same that ruled the world in the days of the Reformation, when men of God stood up at the peril of their lives to expose her iniquities. She possessed the same pride and arrogant assumption that lorded it over kings and princes and claimed the prerogatives of God. Her spirit is no less cruel and despotic now than when she crushed out human liberty and slew the saints of the Most High. This is Great Controversy, page 571. When we hear that the papacy was cruel and crushed out human liberty and slew the saints of the Most High, let's listen to some of the statements of historians about the papacy during the Dark Ages. These are some statements that historians have written about the cruelties of the papacy during the Dark Ages. Number one, Brief Bible Studies, Brief Bible Studies, page 16. Brief Bible Studies, page 16. For professing faith contrary to the Church of Rome, history records the martyrdom of more than 100 million people. Number two, Will Durant, The Story of Civilization, volume 4, page 78. We must rank the Inquisition as among the darkest blots on record of mankind. He said, we must rank the Inquisition as among the darkest blots on record of mankind. And number three, W.E.H. Leakey, History of the Rise and Influence of the Spirit of Rationalism in Europe. That the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a complete knowledge of history. It is impossible to form a complete conception of the multitude of her victims, and it is quite certain that no powers of the imagination can adequately realize their sufferings. Now, I've read to you these excerpts as a reminder of why people became Protestant. I read these excerpts to you from historians that gave quotes from the books that they wrote of why people became Protestants. Because they saw the spirit of the papacy and identified it as the Antichrist of the Bible.
They made that connection that the papacy is the Antichrist of the Bible. Here's the problem, brothers and sisters. Here's the problem. The leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church no longer believes that. Let me be more specific. The General Conference no longer believes that. In February 6th, 1976, the Vice President of the General Conference, Neil C. Wilson, states the conference position regarding the papacy. This is the father of our current General Conference President, Ted Wilson. So this is the father of our General Conference President, Ted Wilson. This is Neil Wilson's statement. In Murakay McLody lawsuit, docket entry number 84. This is Neil Wilson's statement. This is a statement that was taken under sworn deposition. Okay, he was under sworn oath in a lawsuit, and this is the statement that Neil Wilson made, and he is the vice president of the General Conference. This is what he said. Although it is true that there was a period in the life of the Seventh-day Adventist Church when the denomination took a distinctly anti-Roman Catholic viewpoint, that attitude on the church's part was nothing more than a manifestation of a widespread anti-popery among conservative Protestant denominations in the early part of this century and the latter part of the last, which has now been co-signed to the historical trash heap so far as Seventh-day Adventists are concerned. This is Neil Wilson, the Vice President of the General Conference, speaking for all Seventh-day Adventists. And he says that we no longer believe that the papacy is the Antichrist. It doesn't matter what you try to show Neil Wilson in the Bible, a spirit of prophecy about the papacy, because he'll throw it in the garbage. He said he's co-signed it to the trash heap so far as the Seventh-day Adventist church is concerned. This is the vice president, Neil Wilson, on behalf of the General Conference in denial of clear scripture. The prophet of God had said, our religion would be changed and that nothing would stand in the way of the new movement. The prophet said it, that our religion would be changed, and that nothing will stand in the way of the new movement. The new movement is the ecumenical movement. All the churches are coming together. They are surrendering their doctrines and uniting under the leadership of the Pope. We need to be clear, brothers and sisters, on what's happening here. This is a call for all the churches to come together in unity to surrender our doctrines and to unite under the leadership of the Pope. He said that nothing will stand in the way of the new movement. The Sign of the Times, 1894. The Sign of the Times, 1894. Protestants were once thus apart from this great church of apostasy, but they have approached more nearly to her and are still in the path of reconciliation to the Church of Rome. Rome never changes. Her principles have not altered in the least. She has not lessened the breach between herself and Protestant. They have done all of the advancing. But what does this argue for the Protestantism of this day? It is the rejection of the Bible truth which makes men approach to infidelity. So the prophet here states that it is a rejection of Bible truth that has caused men to fall into apostasy and to embrace the papacy. So for Protestants, the reason why Protestants are embracing the papacy and making concessions that enable the church to gravitate closer to Rome is because they are rejecting Bible truth. That's what the prophet said. That's what's happening. Nothing will stand in the way of the new movement. 
because men in responsible positions are rejecting Bible truth. The ecumenical movement, therefore, will ultimately swallow up all of the Protestant churches, bringing them into submission to Rome. Actually, there is confirmation of this being reality from an ex-Jesuit priest. According to ex-Jesuit priest Alberto Rivera, all of the mainstream churches were taken over by 1980. It's a pity to have even to say that at this point in the history of the United States, in the history of the presidents, there has not been other president uh, from the time of President Washington that was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From their own, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, throughout all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy, because no other president has come as close as President Reagan with the Vatican, and even uh, uh, not even John F. Kennedy. What that means is they have done to President Kennedy, uh, to President Reagan, what they were not able to do even through a Roman Catholic president. And of course, President Reagan fit within that picture. Uh, his relationship with the Vatican today uh, brought about several things. One of them is the uh, diplomatic relationship with the Vatican. Second, the preparation for the signature of a concordat between the Vatican and the United States. And if you want to know, this never took place overnight. President Reagan was prepared and is here for the task that is performing today as President of the United States by the Jesuits of Rome in the time that he served as a star in a movie that was very well known and still being shown today, a very old movie, about the, the uh, uh, football team of Notre Dame. Lou Rockney. That's correct. <laughs> This is the time that the first contact was made by the Jesuits with Reagan. Ex-Jesuit, Alberto Rivera was told that a secret sign was to be given to the Jesuits worldwide when the ecumenical movement had successfully wiped out Protestantism. The sign was to be when a president of the United States took his oath of office facing an obelisk. For the first time in United States history, the swearing-in ceremonies were moved to the west front of the Capitol, and President Ronald Reagan faced the Washington Monument, which is an obelisk, and was sworn in as president. This happened January 20th, 1981. While you watch the swearing-in ceremony, please notice the obelisk in the background. The first presidential inauguration to be held at the West Front of the United States Capitol takes place January 20, 1981, with the inauguration of Ronald Wilson Reagan as 40th President of the United States. While nearly all presidents beginning with Thomas Jefferson have been inaugurated at the Capitol. The East Front, facing the Supreme Court, has been the traditional site. Administered by Justice Berger, because of that rapid turnover of presidents with uh, Nixon and then Ford and then Carter. Left hand on the Bay Bible and raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Now, congratulations, you, sir.
If this is true, if ex-Jesuit Alberto Rivera is to be believed, then what we have here is a union of church and state. The government is working in cooperation with the papacy to bring about the demise of Protestantism. And they're giving secret signs to the Jesuits around the world applauding their destructive work. The idea of church and state working together is certainly plausible because we know that in 1991 there was a holy alliance, a clandestine campaign between Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II to bring about the dissolution of the Soviet government and an end of communism. Certainly there is a union between church and state working together to achieve their objectives. But is there any support to the claims of Alberto Rivera that this alliance is wiping out Protestantism? Actually, there is. And it's found in the scriptures. I'm going to refer you to Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter 11, verses 40 through 41. Book of Daniel, chapter 11, verse 40 through 41. This is what it says. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter the countries and overwhelm them and pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but there shall escape from his hand Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. Because of time, we won't be able to look at the depths of this prophecy. I'm not going to be able to look at the depths of this prophecy because of time. But I will identify the necessary symbols and make an application. Okay, this is a prophecy about the time of the end as stated in verse 40, which began in 1798. The king of the south is the empire of communism or secular governments of communist atheism. That's the king of the south. The king of the south is the secular governments, more pointedly communism or the secular governments of atheism, communist atheism. The king of the north is the papacy. Okay, prophecy says that the king of the south will attack the king of the north. This was fulfilled in 1798 when religion was outlawed. Religious people were killed. It was the age of reason and the emperor Napoleon had Pope Pius VI arrested. He was thrown in jail where he died. But the prophecy goes on to say that the king of the north comes against the king of the south like a whirlwind, and he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. So the king of the north, which is the papacy, destroys the king of the south, which is communism. And this prophecy was fulfilled in 1991, when Ronald Reagan and the Pope, through a clandestine campaign, brought about the fall of the former Soviet Republic in an end of communism. This was sweet revenge, or sweet deceit. Step by reluctant step, the Soviets and the communist government of Poland bowed to the moral, economic, and political pressures imposed by the Pope and the President. Jails were emptied. The country's economy collapsed. The Polish Communist Party fought amongst themselves. Soviet officials conceded defeat as the world watched the Iron Curtain being torn to the ground. This happened in 1991. So we have a date. And the reason why this date is so significant is because the prophecy says in verse 41, Daniel chapter 11, verse 41, that he, the papacy, shall also enter into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. Okay, the glorious land is not a specific geographic location, but rather it is God's worldwide church. It's spiritual Israel. 
You know, you can, brothers and sisters, I would like you to examine this prophecy yourself. You should look at it yourself. Because of time, I don't have to go, I don't have the time to go into the specific details of it. But what I'm saying to you is that the glorious land is spiritual Israel. That's what the glorious land is. We are spiritual Israel. We're God's covenant keeping people. When a king invades another country and conquers it, the king removes the flag of the conquered people and replaces it with its own flag. Because, according to Alberto Rivera in 1981, Protestantism was wiped out. Therefore, we should see not only the demise of Protestantism, but also the evidence of a surrender. Now, actually, in the church, we do see the evidence of surrender. A surrender of our message. In 1991, when our Seventh-day Adventist church changed its logo from the three angels' message, or the three angels, unto an open Bible, a cross, and a flame. So in 1991, our Seventh-day Adventist church, we changed our logo from three angels to an open Bible, a cross, and a flame. One fact is clear. In 1991, the Seventh-day Adventist church logo was changed. It was no longer the three angels' message. And the reason for that is because the established Seventh-day Adventist church is no longer proclaiming the three angels' message. We're not hearing in the church messages about victory over sin. We're not hearing about the investigative judgment. We're not hearing about the atonement. We don't hear messages that the papacy is the Antichrist or the man of sin. We don't hear about the mark of the beast. We're not hearing about the seal of God or the nature of Christ. We don't hear messages about the sanctuary or messages about the remnant. Do you know why the established Seventh-day Adventist Church is no longer declaring the three angels' message honestly, according to the word of God? Because the papacy has entered into the glorious land in fulfillment of Bible prophecy. That's why we're not hearing these messages anymore. The papacy has entered into the glorious land. Second Selected Messages, page 385. Second Selected Messages, page 385. A company was presented before me under the name of Seventh-day Adventists who were advising that the banner or sign which makes us a distinctive people should not be held out so strikingly for they claimed it was not the best policy in securing success to our institutions. I saw some reaching out their hands to remove the banner and obscure its significance. Okay? The banner or the sign which makes us a distinctive people is the three angels' message. It's not, it's not the Sabbath, brothers and sisters, because there are other churches, there are other professed Protestant churches that actually are Sabbath keepers, that keep the Sabbath. But our banner or our sign that makes us a distinctive people is the three angels' message. The Seventh-day Adventist church is the only church that has the three angels' message. And this prophecy says that the message is not being proclaimed because the church wants to secure greater success, meaning more wealth through compromise. There are Seventh-day Adventists that are proclaiming the Three Angels message, but for the most part, these faithful men and women are associated with independent ministries. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 19. Seventh-day Adventists have been given a work of the most solemn import. The proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's message. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Testimonies, Volume 7, page 138. Testimonies, Volume 7, page 138. Seventh-day Adventists have been chosen by God as a peculiar people. He has made them the representatives and has called them to be ambassadors for him in the last work of salvation. The greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals, the most fearful warnings ever sent by God to man to be given to the world. 
but men in responsible positions are unwilling to be ambassadors for God. Rather than offend people with a message of righteousness, they have taken down the banner in exchange for worldly success. In other words, we should not expect the Three Angels' message to be proclaimed within the established Seventh-day Adventist Church. Because the Bible says, in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 and 41, that the King of the North has entered into the Glorious Land. That means that the papacy has infiltrated our Seventh-day Adventist Church. That's why the logo was changed in the early 1990s from Three Angels logo to an open Bible, a cross, and a flame. And when the Three Angels logo was removed, it was because the Three Angels message was removed. And Spirit of Prophecy says that men in responsible positions reached out their hands to remove the banner. The banner is the Three Angels message. They removed it because it was more profitable to them. They wanted to prosper. Isn't that the same motivation of Judas Iscariot when he betrayed Jesus Christ? Judas wanted to prosper, so he gave up Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. So actually, this is all very reasonable to believe. Here's ex-Jesuit Alberto Rivera explaining his job as a Jesuit in infiltrating Protestant churches for the purpose of the papacy gaining a stronghold and greater supremacy. A specialized work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Uh, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation in, in, in through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. The pressure for Sunday in the future is an issue. Is that a product of the of the Jesuits, or or what do you know about that? Well, what I know is this: that even the Seventh Day Adventist denomination yeah. has been placed under the greatest setup and and a real setup of all the history of the denomination. And the proof and evidence is that now. The, the leadership is already uh, in a position where they themselves cannot play the role of uh, uh, Frankenstein no longer because they've been unveiled, they've been discovered and they're intense and they're truly intense in cases where uh, already most of them has been already uh, trained, prepared by Jesus to be what they are. So, also, in regard to the BEM document, which our Seventh-day Adventist Church has signed, in view of the third component, which is ministry, this document forbids proselytizing, meaning that you can't tell people in other churches about the gospel to win them over. And the third angel's message is the everlasting gospel. You can't tell people about that according to the BEM document. Also, you can't say anything bad about other religions. You can't point out their errors. In signing that BEM document, our Seventh-day Adventist Church has agreed not to preach the second or the third angel's message. That's the agreement, according to the BEM document, that our church signed. Before we conclude, I have another point that's worth mentioning. 
In the photos of the World Council of Churches, you saw Reverend Dr. Oleg Feisk Tavit. Dr. Oleg Tavit is the General Secretary of the World Council of Churches. Prior to his appointment as General Secretary, Dr. Oleg Tavit was a member of Faith and Order, Plenary Commission, and as a co-chair of the Palestine-Israel Ecumenical Forum Core Group. As you view these pictures of the members of the World Council of Churches, in this photo op, if you look closely, standing next to Dr. Oleg Tavit is Kofi Annan. Kofi Annan is the seventh Secretary General of the United Nations. As Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan is a world moderator in all meetings of the General Assembly. When dignitaries, diplomats, and heads of state assemble at a United Nations meeting, it is Kofi Annan, the Secretary General, who addresses all of these political leaders. So in looking at these pictures of Kofi Annan, who is a politician, in a photo op with the World Council of Churches, it's natural to conclude that this ecumenical movement is more than a gathering of religious leaders willing to lay aside doctrine and unite on common ground. But in looking at these photos, it is fair to conclude that this is a union of church and state. That's what we're looking at, brothers and sisters. We're looking at a union of church and state. The Bible said that this would happen. In God's word, God's word said that this would happen. Spirit of prophecy prophesied that this would happen. We are living in a time in the history of the world where we are seeing all of these events coming to fruition. Brothers and sisters, I would ask you to please continue to join me in our next video, part six, as we continue in our series, Spiritual Formation, the Omega of Apostasy. And you are going to see sadly, and I do say sadly, brothers and sisters, you are going to see that our church, our Seventh-day Adventist church, is going to take yet another step in this awful apostasy. Stay with me. Please join me for part six as we continue in our series, Spiritual Formation, the Omega of Apostasy.